I went to bed last night fully intending to continue our study on the book of Ephesians this morning. But over the last week and the last couple of days, being mindful of Easter and uh, Resurrection Sunday and these things, there's been a couple of verses that have uh, kind of leapt out at me. And I had uh, one particular thought this morning that just hit me between the eyes. And I'm trusting that it's of the Lord this morning that he be in it. If you would read with me here in the 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 6. It says, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm going to pause there for just a second. This is not the exact verse that hit me this morning, but it is the, the foundation of it. It is the mindset and the reason that the Apostle Paul is writing it here to his son in the ministry, Timothy. And as I am this morning, as pastor to his congregation, encouraging and stirring you up and trying to bring you into remembrance of some things that we need to be reminded of. Because this verse, verse 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How many have heard that verse? How many love that verse? Do you know that verse doesn't just hang out there by itself? It's not cherry-picked like he just throws that out there just in some way. It just, oh, by the way, God's not giving you the spirit of fear. He's given you a, a power of strong mind and of love. He's given you these things so that you might not be fearful. We actually have some strength to help us be reminded of those things. There is something inside of us that the Apostle Paul wants to stir up in us to re bring to remembrance because upon the remembrance of these things, we will find our strength. That's the reason that the Apostle Paul is writing this unto his son in the ministry, Timothy. And the reason that I want to share this with you as my congregation this morning, God's not given us the spirit of fear. I know this world is a fearful place. I know this world is a place that uh, you will find yourself being ridiculed and mocked, judged, judged unjustly, sometimes. Sometimes I deserve the judgment that I get. This world will try to paint you as being something that you're not. This world will make you to be something that you're not from time to time. I know this world is a hard place, and it's something that we struggle with from time to time. But a spirit of fear, understand the difference between a spirit of fear and being afraid. I am afraid of heights. That might be shocking to my wife and girls because I love mountains. and I'll walk right up to the edge and look over the side because I love the views. And I'll climb up to the top of anything you need me to climb onto. But rest assured on the inside, John's shaking. Because I am afraid of heights. There's a reason I don't jump off of tall things because I'm afraid of what it's going to feel like landing at the bottom. I am afraid of certain things, but I do not have a spirit of fear. A spirit of fear is to have fear consume you, to overrule you, to guide you, to keep you and hold you back. That is a spirit of fear, a, a, a mindset that has you afraid to go forward, afraid to do things, afraid to try to be different, afraid to uh, be the Christian that God's called you out to be, afraid to be the husband that I've never been before, afraid to be the wife that I've never accomplished before. To afraid to be the church member that I know I should be, but I've not quite accomplished it yet. A spirit of fear is one that holds you back because I failed too many times. I've tried and I don't know how. I don't have examples in my life. Whatever the reason may be, a spirit of fear is different than being afraid. If you find yourself in a position of having a spirit of fear, that is not of God. Fear is a gift of God. I've told y'all this before. Every 
old man needs to thank God that God gave us fear because we would never survive being a young man. Because young boys do stupid things. And if it wasn't for fear, we'd do even dumber things. God has given us fear for a reason, but he has not given us the spirit of fear. But rather, he has given us a, a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore, continue on with me, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. That's one of those things you need to have stirred up in your mind. We find great power and strength in understanding God saved us. Y'all know that? Come on now, this is Easter morning. Y'all gonna have to perk up a little bit this morning. Y'all know God saved us? He's not saving us. He's not trying to save us. He's not hoping to save us. God is not sitting in heaven wringing his hands and just hoping that his children will listen, just hoping that his children will respond so that he might be able to have his children with him. God has saved us. I don't have to be afraid of hell. I don't have to be afraid of death. I don't have to be afraid of Satan. God has saved me. I need that stirred up in me from time to time. God has saved us. Y'all are getting there. And called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works. Aren't y'all glad God doesn't do this because of how good we are? Because the reality is, he would not do this because how sorry we are. If it was according to us, there would be no one in heaven but God. There is no exception to that rule. There is no, I've done good enough. There is no, I've repented enough. There is no, I've prayed enough. There is no, I've tried hard enough that's going to get you into heaven. If it was according to our works, we would fail 100%. So many people say, I just wish God gave everybody a chance. You believe in that election thing. Well, I just believe God gave everybody the same chance. I thank God he gave no one a chance. I don't want a chance at heaven. I have a promise of heaven. Humanity had a 100% guarantee of hell across the board. And God chose. And because of his choice, we will be in heaven. And he called us with a holy calling. This, this calling is not the gospel. I tell you this morning, I got the gospel on my mind and it's what I'm getting to. But this calling is not the gospel. This holy calling that he says he has already done to us is that calling of regeneration when he calls out your name and you are a dead alien sinner and he quickens you into life as Paul says in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2 and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins. This is the holy calling that he is speaking about here. When God looks at you as a dead alien sinner and says live, and 100% success rate, we live. We need this stuff stirred up in our minds. And he did not because of our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. And this purpose and grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. 
I'll never read this and not be mindful of Brother Harold Stumball, though I still don't fully understand it. I'm thankful for it. We were in Christ before we were in Adam. I'm still studying out all the results of that. God's purpose and grace was given to us before the world ever began. Before we ever messed up, before Adam fell, before our own transgressions and foolishness, we were already given God's purpose and grace. That is amazing. But it is now made manifest. These things that he says, our salvation. Y'all please be listening this morning because this is just the introduction. I've got a lot I want to say this morning. I really want to get there. I want to know y'all get this. All these things, our salvation, our calling, that purpose, that grace that was given to us is made manifest. Y'all know what that means to make it manifest? It is not to produce it. It's to make it visible. It's to make you able to see it. It's to make you able to understand it. It is to make it manifest unto you. When you walk into a dark room and you turn the light on, it does not put those things in the floor and around the room when you turn the light on. It makes them manifest. It shows itself. Our salvation, our calling, God's purpose and grace is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The fact the truth, the absolute fact that there was indeed nearly 2,000 years ago a man born of a virgin by the name of Jesus makes God's purpose and plan and all of those prophecies and everything no longer just a thought. No longer just a maybe. They are shown as proof positive. And as he lived, the manifestation of our salvation and our calling and, our, and God's purpose and grace in our lives is shown forth by the fact, the truth that Jesus Christ lived. He is made, it is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. He hath, hath, hath. We know what that means. It's done. He's not abolishing death. He's not working on death. He has, perfect present tense, has abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. What is the purpose of the gospel? I will never forget my ordination for a lot of reasons. I'll never forget it. And uh, Elder Gary Harvey was going to be doing my questioning for it, and thankfully he gave me some uh, preview of some of the questions he had on his mind that he intended to ask me, because you know it's a little nervous sitting in that chair in front of everybody, it's, it's a little nerve-wracking, in case y'all didn't know that. So thankfully he shared and previewed me, with me some of the things he intended to ask me so that I might not be caught completely off guard. Of course, then they opened up for the other ministers and you get caught off guard there. But uh, he shared with me a preview and told me he intended to ask me, do I believe that the gospel has anything to do with our eternal salvation? I warned him that I would answer the question yes. No. I said, yes. He said, no. I said, just ask and you'll find out. I guess he thought I was kidding. Because there we are in my ordination, and I'm sitting there, and he asked the question. 
John, do you believe that the gospel has anything to do with our eternal salvation? And I answered yes. And you could hear the <gasps> around the room. And his face I will never forget. Now, now John, Our, the gospel is not that which gets us born again. I know that. And I told him that that day. I said, I know that the gospel does not have anything to do with getting us born again, but it has everything to do with our eternal salvation. It is our connection to it. It is that which tells us about it. It is that which shines a light about it. And the reason that I stay so on fire about this, and, and, I, and I wanted to bring this out, I knew it would shock people. And to some extent, I did it on purpose. And if that's wrong, then I ask God's forgiveness. But... Old Baptists have had this horrible problem and issue with wanting to just simply give gospel power. They want to tell you everything the gospel doesn't do, what the gospel doesn't apply to, and the gospel doesn't do this, and the gospel doesn't do that. To the whole time of my childhood, I can tell you, hand on the book, I came up believing the gospel was useless because all I was ever told is what it didn't do. And the more I read, the more I realized what it did do. I've heard grammatical somersaults be done there in the book of Romans where it tells us, for the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Trying to make that unto the saved. No, it says unto salvation. Don't try to do somersaults out of it so you don't sound like somebody else. God has given us a gift that we need stirred up in us. God has given us a gift that we need to bring into remembrance because understanding the gospel is where we find access to this spirit of a sound mind and of love and of power. It is through an understanding of the gospel that we have access to this. He says that Jesus Christ being born, y'all please understand this, Jesus Christ being born was proof positive in the manifestation of our salvation. It was the proof positive in manifestation of God's purpose and grace in our lives. It is proof positive and manifestation of God's holy calling quickening into life something that was dead. The gospel is the proof positive that all of that is not a fairy tale. The gospel is that which brings that life and immortality into light for us. Our need to understand the gospel cannot be compared to. So this morning, I want to share the gospel with you. And I want you to get the power of the gospel. I want you to see how it was handed down and how it was given to us. I want you all to turn back with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. I want to look at three times that an angel brought the gospel to man. And in these three tellings of the gospel, you have come together the full gospel church. I know today there's those that declare, well, we're, we're the full gospel church. And they try to make that about earthly foolishness. And it's full gospel because I believe that uh, you'll be happy, healthy, wealthy, and blessed if you believe it. That's not full gospel. I'm going to give you the full gospel this morning. Y'all want it? You want it stirred up in you? As I tell you, when we get to the end, I hope it hits you just as hard as it did me. Where does the gospel begin? The gospel begins in a telling we find here in uh, Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 20. It says, but while he, that being uh, Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, 
But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That is the beginning of the gospel. That's where it begins. The promise. That you can follow this promise from here all the way back to the very beginnings of the book of Genesis. When God comes down and pronounces the curse upon man because of their foolishness and their wickedness. And I could get caught up in a lot of these things and spend a lot of time here. I'm going to try not to. But we can look all the way back in the beginning of Genesis when God is proclaiming the curse on man and he declares that her seed will bruise the serpent's head. Women don't have seed. But this woman did. That was the very first promise of the gospel. This is the manifestation of that holy calling. How is it that we're born again? I present you exhibit A. Is there anything inside of me prior to regeneration that had life? Was there any spiritual life inside of me? Or do we honestly believe in total depravity of man. Dead, empty, no life in him, but God. Who spoke to that empty womb of a virgin that had no life in it of itself, and he spoke to that womb, and Jesus was conceived inside of her. How does regeneration work? There it is. There is the manifestation of that holy calling that he gives to every one of his children when he looks at you and he says, Live, you don't have an option. Well, maybe not today, Lord. Maybe I'm really not feeling it today. There was no option. When God looks at you and he says, Live, you live. When God looked at that empty womb that had nothing in it of itself to have life, did that stop God? God had been promising this from the beginning. God had been looking forward to this from the beginning. And now was the time. The angel comes to Joseph and tells him to not be afraid to take his wife, his spouse wife to him. She's not been cheating on you. She's not been fooling around. That that's conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And so is that that's inside of you. It is of the Holy Ghost. And here's why that was done. She's going to have a son. Did she do that? When she does, you're going to call him Jesus. Was that his name? And that son that is in her that you will call Jesus will save the world. His people from the world. Every word of this is important. Every word of the gospel is important. So how important is it for you to be here for every word of the gospel? You miss one word, you miss an important word. He shall save 
his people from their sins. Did Jesus give us tools to better our lives? Yes. Did God give us teachings through Christ of an example of a life that if we follow it, our life is going to be better? Yes. Absolutely. But did Jesus come here to save you from poverty? Did Jesus come here to save you from the sniffles? Did Jesus come here to save you from cancer? I know that so many of us wish that he did. Because I know those things are hard. But that's a part of the sin-cursed world. And that he has saved us from. A day is coming that this world, this sin-cursed, hard world, all of the troubles, all of the sickness, all of the tears, all of the pains will be dealt with and taken away. And we have been saved from that destruction. But Jesus Christ came here to save us from our sins. When you read in Isaiah 53, when it says that by his stripes we are healed, and Peter repeats that in his epistle. By his stripes, we were healed. He's not talking about poverty. He's not talking about the cancer. He's not talking about drunkenness. He's not talking about addiction. I know that's hard. But if we try to make it that way, if we allow ourselves to try to twist the gospel to apply to every aspect of your life, and if you believe the gospel and follow the gospel enough, then his stripes will save you. Do you know anybody that's successful at that? Guess what that makes him? That makes him a failure. That makes him a liar. And that can't happen. He came to save us from our sins. And by his stripes, we were healed. That's awesome. So the angel comes here, and he presents the beginning of the gospel, of all of the promised of him coming. And the amount of prophecies, and like I said, there's so many more good ones I'd love to, to talk to you about. But y'all don't want to be here as long as that would take. I know that. But God had promised from the beginning that that was going to come, and he came and made one more promise in the gospel of he is coming. And there he is conceived inside of her. Look with me in the book of Luke chapter 2. Y'all probably know where I'm going here. The second proclamation of the second part of the gospel is the fulfillment of that promise in Luke chapter 2. Starting in verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Here is the second part of the gospel. 
It opens with God intended this from the beginning. That's why he promised it from the beginning. God intended for us to be saved before the foundation of the world. That is that manifestation of the promise of how he intended and his grace and purpose was given to us before the foundation of the world. It is made manifest how it is that we have that holy calling, how that virgin brought forth the son. And now to prove positive, it's not just a story tale. He's here. He's lying in a manger. And the angels come and they show themselves unto the shepherds that are out keeping their flocks by night. And I want you to get the second part of the gospel. Because I think it's the one sometimes we miss. Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And skip down, it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, You want to know the second part of the gospel that I think the majority of us Christians, especially us old Baptists, have forgotten? The second part of the gospel is we ought to be praising God like we've never done it before. Lord, help, we're afraid of raising our hands, and you know, I admit half of us are afraid to even give a good hearty amen to a sermon. I have to call you and say, come on now, wake up. This angel did not show up and say, hey, you know, Jesus is real. You know, it, it, I promise you, he really is. Lord, help us if that's the way we share the gospel. He comes and he says, I bring you great tidings, good tidings of great joy. For unto you is born a Savior. He didn't have to work up to being a Savior. He was born Savior, which is Christ. Y'all know that's not his name? His name is not Jesus Christ. Christ is not the name of Jesus. We've adopted it that way because it's written that way. But Christ is an explanation of him. It's an adjective. It means anointed. Specifically chosen and anointed. Jesus, the anointed one of God, a Savior, was born this day. You know, the second part of the gospel is you ought to be celebrating that your Savior lives. He is real. He is alive. He is abiding well. And in this, you have good, fitting tidings that fit the situation. That's what good means. It's as it should be. It's not just good. People all the time talking about how the gospel is good news. I know that's the literal definition. And I think sometimes this is the downfall of trying to take everything back to the Greek. You know, gospel, don't be too afraid of Greek because don't say gospel if you're going to be afraid of Greek. It's transliteration. There was no English word for it. So gospel is the Greek word for gospel. But sometimes in our constant trying to go back and understand the, the root word and everything, we undermine some of what's being said because quite literally, yes, gospel does mean good news. But we confuse good with our common definition of good. We fit it as good news like, oh, well, that's good. Uh, Y'all pray for my daughters because uh, they're preacher's kids, so they, they find themselves. My daughter found out this last week that if you turn in your homework, you actually get a passing grade. Oh, well, that's good news. That's good news. And it was good news, and we were all thankful for it because she was afraid she was going to fail a class out. It was good news. We're glad of it. But that's not what it means. Good is fitting. It is as it should be. 
So we, we, we belittle it by trying to say it's just, well, that's good news and try to make that something. This, this news is as God intended it to be. Did you know God wanted you to know that Jesus Christ was born? Did you know that every child of God ought to know that they have a Savior which is alive? That's what it means by good news. It is news that every child of God needs to know. It is news that we need to share with every child of God because it belongs to them. It's fitting for them. That's what it means by good news when you take it back to the Greek. It's not, oh, well, that's good news. No, I tell you, if you want to try to take that angle for it, it is great news. It is the greatest news I have ever heard in my life that Jesus Christ died for me. Are you kidding? Have you met me? And Jesus Christ died for me? Are you kidding? That is the greatest news I've ever heard in my life. Christians ought to be the happiest people on the face of God's green earth. We got more reason to celebrate and praise. It's, it, it's ridiculous. You know that? I'm in a good mood this morning. Y'all ought to be too. This is great news. Our Savior was born. He was born for a purpose. And he was born on purpose. Turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 24. There is no uh, angel telling of what took place in the previous chapters here for me to go to. I trust you all know. Jesus Christ was promised for a purpose and on purpose. Jesus Christ was born on purpose for a purpose. And that was so that he would save us from our sins. Brothers and sisters, that didn't happen in some small, insignificant way. He wouldn't get it done by just simply praying it away. Y'all hearing me? Jesus did not simply pray your sins away. He did not simply sweep them under the rug. He didn't just simply go to his father and say, Lord, God, Father, just, just forgive them. I've lived the life. I, I understand the temptations that are here. It's understandable that they messed up. Well, there was a price to pay. And Jesus paid that price. The price, the wages of sin, is death. The price that was upon our head for Christ to redeem us was death. Can you imagine... Being born, knowing you were living to die. Knowing you were not living to die an old man. Not to die of old age, not to die in just a random accident. Being born, knowing you were living to die the most humiliating, painful, dreadful death that man has ever come up with. Can you imagine that? That alone would be enough to cripple any one of us. But Christ endured that from his youth, knowing that was coming for him. 
And when it came time, he saw to it on purpose that he was in Jerusalem when he needed to be there. He knew that he was going to go into Jerusalem with that Palm Sunday triumphant entry as everyone was going to be celebrating. We sang it this morning, not very well, but we sang it this morning. Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest. As they laid the palm leaves out as he rode in on the, the foal of an ass, uh, came in and riding in that triumphant entrance and everybody was celebrating. Can you imagine that situation? We would be just... Wow, it's awesome, but just put yourself in Christ's shoes knowing, yep, you're going to turn your back on me. Yep, you're going to be crying for my crucifixion. I don't know why you're out here putting palm leaves down. You're going to be one of the witnesses that come against me. You're, can you imagine the, the, the amount of contradiction in that? But still, he rode in triumphantly anyway. Can you imagine living a life for 33 years preaching a perfect gospel knowing that 99% of us would turn our backs on it at least once in our life? There was enough to make him stop long before the cross got there. And he rode into Jerusalem, still saw to it that every prophecy was answered, went in and defended the church drove them out of the temple because they were making the church about money. I tell you, the church in America needs to go read that section again. Well, we got the coffee houses. And we got... Anyway. He drove them out and declared his house was to be known as the house of prayer. And he lived that life and he came in and he came into Jerusalem and he did the work and he went and he prayed the prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying, Lord, if it be your will, take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine. And when they came to take him, he willfully went with them. And the sheep before the shears was dumb. He opened not his mouth. Not once did he defend himself. Not once did he try to convince them otherwise. He would answer their question. Are you really the son of God? My kingdom is not of this world. Are you a king? My kingdom is not of this world. Don't you know I have the power over you? You have no power over what God has given you. But never once defended himself. Not once. Because he went on purpose. He didn't stop it. They beat him. They spat on him. They tore his flesh from him. They rent his clothes and made a mockery of him, casting lots over who was going to get to win to take the bloody clothes home with him. Made him drag his own cross out of the city. Drag it all the way to Golgotha's hill. And there on the cross, Jesus Christ on purpose laid down on the cross and let them drive nails through his hands. And I still believe at that point, he still had the strength to stand up and walk away. Because man did not kill Jesus. He laid down. Oh, man, there's so many things coming this morning. Remember Abraham and Isaac? Isaac willingly was tied up and placed on the altar. I believe being a perfect picture of Christ that will make present himself a lamb. He willfully laid out his hands for the nails to go through him. And he hung on the cross for me for you, and just as the angel promised, for all of his people. And there on the cross, God poured out his wrath upon him, and God killed Jesus Christ in our stead. And fear come upon all of Christianity. 
like we've not ever really felt. We think this is a scary world right now. We can't, we can't compare to that. You think maybe they needed something stirred up in their minds? Now comes the angel for the final piece of the gospel. Jesus Christ was killed on the cross, laid in the borrowed tomb, and now here we are three days later in chapter 24. It says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, why do we meet on, on Sunday? There it is. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. <clears throat> Three days later, Two ladies go to do the work because they were convinced that it was over. Has this world ever convinced you that it's over? Does pain and suffering and sorrow and loss and death and all these things ever convince you that it's over? These three of these ladies came convinced it was over. And they found the stone rolled away. And the angel said, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Remember what he said. The verse that leapt out on me on the way to church this morning that, that uh, made me change what I wanted to was the stone has rolled away. And I started picturing that we watched The Passion last night in faith. We watched it last night. I try to watch it at least once a year. It's hard to watch. But the image of that at the end of the movie come out at me last night like I don't think it ever has. And it reminded me again this morning as I was still thinking of it there at the end of the movie when the stone rolls back and that dark tomb slowly comes into life. It, I don't even remember the dry look that it was on. But it dawned on me. That's the gospel. The gospel is the rolling away of the stone. The stone didn't roll back to make Jesus the Savior. The stone didn't roll back to make him uh, uh, alive again. I don't believe the stone rolled back even to let him out. The stone was rolled back to make manifest, to bring to light the work that God has done. Brothers and sisters, there are people out there in the world right now that need that stone rolled back for them. They are convinced that it's over. They are convinced that it doesn't get any better than this world because the earth is still in the way. The world is still in the way. And the gospel truth is the rolling back of that stone to say, look, he's not there. He's alive. He is risen. 
He was born for you. He lived for you. He died for you. And he rose again for you. And your understanding of that doesn't make it true. Your acceptance of it, it doesn't make it true. The lights coming on inside that tomb didn't make it true. And the light coming on inside of you doesn't make it true. It makes manifest. It brings life and immortality to light. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is alive and well. He is seated on the right hand of God. He is our Savior. Brothers and sisters, we need it stirred up in us. We need reminded and we need to remember these things. Because it is the vision of that empty tomb that was brought to light by the rolling back of that stone. So those women could look in and see he's not there. That is our source and our connection to that spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. Because God is really that good. Well, I hope that gets y'all just as... I still want to shout about it now. I wish I had a whole another hour to preach about it. The stone was rolled back. For our benefit. He wasn't robbed. He didn't steal himself away. He was legally let out. The earth tried to hold him back. It took two grown full sized men. To roll that stone shut. It's not some small little pebble. The world and its governments tried to keep him dead. It was sealed shut with Pilate's seal. Let me ask you, when did that stop God? He came out. What does the gospel do? Why is the gospel important? Because the gospel peels back the dirt. It peels back the rocks. It peels back the world. That it is heavy. It took me my whole life to pile up the stone that had me convinced that the gospel meant nothing. It took one gospel message to roll it away. Y'all get me? What does the gospel do? The world will tell you that the so-called legal removal of prayer in the Bible from schools removes God from it. The world and its religions and its, its, its governments will tell you that to be true. They'll try to seal him out. But I can tell you that as long as children of God live as children of God, God's still there. You can pass all the laws you want to. You ain't stopping him. The gospel breaks all the rules of this world. It peels back the seal of government. It peels back the world. It peels back all of that to reveal that that tomb is empty. He walked out of it on his own power. Nobody else had to revive him. He walked out of it of his own power changed and ready the image that one day I will be and he's not going back there. Why seek ye the living among the dead? Are you looking for Christ? You're not going to find him in the dead works of the world. You're not going to find him in trying to serve your boss. You're not going to try to find him out in the world. You've got to look for the living and the living. He's not here. There was a time when Jesus was subject under the rules and regulations of this world. He's not there anymore. He's not subject under the rules and the regulations and the confines of this world and its regulations and its laws and its governments and everything else that he willingly subjected himself unto them. He's not under that anymore. He couldn't care less that there's laws saying I can't take a Bible into a schoolhouse. Makes me sick that they make them. He 
couldn't care less. For thy word have I given my heart. Let's see him stop that one. The gospel. It's the good news. The full gospel. Y'all want it? I'll give it to you in a nutshell. The full gospel of Jesus Christ is as the angel told, before the foundation of the world, God chose, loved his people and promised that the day will come that he will be born. We have proof positive that he was. He was born. And he did die. And being perfect, the only way he could die was to take our sins from us and put them upon himself. And he successfully died and laid in a tomb for only three days. And he's not there anymore. The tomb is empty and he is seated on the right hand of God freely. And because he lives, we will live. That's the gospel. Does it have anything to do with your eternal salvation? I can tell you it's got everything to do with mine. It may not have gave it to me. But it sure does help me understand it. I do thank you. And God bless. I will sing the wonder story. Thank you again for joining us at Salem Primitive Baptist Church. I pray that the Word of God may brightly shine in your lives. If you would like to contact us or would like to download a copy of today's message, please go to www.salempbchurch.com. God bless you all. Crystal sea, crystal sea.